All right, let's continue with the stored cross-site scripting. Now, as we said before, reflected cross-site scripting is kind of kiddie play. Uh, sorry about that, by the way, I don't know why that's happening. Uh, we'll talk about what it is, stored cross-site scripting. We'll talk about the test objectives, just like we did with our other cross-site scripting, the reflected one. And we'll talk about how to test for it, like the black box testing, the gray box testing, bypassing cross-site scripting filters. And a little bit about tools and references so let's dig into what we have here first stored cross-site scripting happens when data gets stored within the application this means that the data is persistent if we send it to the application and call back the other get request it will get that data for us and this will affect any user who visits that malicious page now that's very very important because that makes stored cross-site scripting a lot more impactful than reflected cross-site scripting where you need an action from the user. In stored cross-site scripting you might need that but not always. So that's important to know. Stored inputs are not correctly sanitized or not correctly filtered. They're just put into the database without putting any more thought into it and that's what stored cross-site scriptings happen. OWASP also refers to them as second-order cross-site scriptings and I can agree with that definition. These are the most dangerous attacks as it does not require user interaction all of the time, which as you guys know stored cross-site scripting does. There is a social engineering aspect to that which stored cross-site scripting does not have. So the typical attack scenario of a stored cross-site scripting consists of the attacker storing malicious code into your vulnerable page and then the user authenticating in the application, visiting that vulnerable page and maliciously executing that code. That's going to either steal their cookie, send it to the attacker or it's going to trigger a hook for beef for example or XSS Hunter. So there's many different things that you can do with that malicious code in and of itself. Uh, the design step is where the attacker again creates and tests an offending URI or an offending parameter, sends it to the server, waits until it's stored somewhere and until the visitor visits it. Um, then when the victim visits the vulnerable web page, there will be an execution of the payload on that victim's browser again causing a hook or causing something to happen which is not good. That would be the default modus operandi of a stored cross-site scripting. Now as for the challenges, they are pretty much the same as for reflected cross-site scripting. The only thing is that this is also a lot more dangerous, this is really important in areas where users can have higher privileges. Because, for example, if I insert my stored cross-site scripting attack vector into my blog post and an administrator views my blog post from his administrative panel, um, it is a lot more impactful if I can steal their cookies and I can look at that administrative panel. And even if I can't steal their cookies, I might be able to delete some posts, I might be able to edit some posts, I might be able to do some stuff that I'm not supposed to be able to do. So. In higher privileged areas it will be a lot more dangerous and the attack is automatically executed by the browser when the victim visits it. Now it can of course happen that you need the onmost over event handler and then some user interaction is required. But of course the onmost over you can make a pixel as big as the screen and onmost over that and then it's also done. Um, as for the test objectives, in this one we want to identify any stored input and where it is reflected in the client side. It can either be HTML context or sometimes JavaScript context as well. Then we want to assess the input they accept and see if we can pass around any filters. This is really important because the filter evasion techniques are going to help you quite a lot in this. Um, this is very active hunting, so you're going to try a lot of filter evasion techniques and you're going to see specifically where your value is reflected and how you can break out of that reflection. Now, you can, of course, let's talk a little bit about how to test for this. It's a little bit the same as the reflected cross-site scripting, but there are some differences, of course. We also need to detect all of our input factors, but the, the tester, in this case, he's going to have to 
dig a little bit deeper and he's going to have to look at all of the specific functionalities which allow for storing values into the database and this can go very very deep for example a file manager can be happening because a, a file name can also be reflected onto the page which might also cause a cross-site scripting event um, we can have application settings which might cause cross-site scripting it can be self cross-site scripting at that moment of course but if you chain it with csrf you have an account takeover possible um, there is a for message board possibility you can read through this guys um, it's most important that you use your imagination and that you find all of the values that can be stored all of them including file names including weird stuff all of it really really important then you need to analyze all of your input factors and as a tester you will try to input specifically crafted input factors for every parameter again this is much the same as for your reflected cross-site scripting as in the example for the html tag attribute we've used the same example this can be done it really depends on what your target is filtering and what not of course then you also have your html context possibility you have your sheet sheet here that you can go through and look at all of these specific evasion techniques. Then you can also analyze the HTML code. That's really important because you need to know where your stored application is going to be reflected. And it's going to usually be an HTML tags, but it can also be found in a J uh, JavaScript context. Very important to know. And the tester should always investigate out of band channels such as customer support channels, such as sales representative channels, administrative channels for blind XSS. It's really, really important and I cannot stress this enough. All data has to be tested by inserting in user areas and then viewing the data in the administration areas. So you're going to make a blog post and you're going to view it as an administrator. This is really important because that is where the most impactful cross-site scripting events can happen in those admin panels you can hook your blind cross-site scripting with beef it's pretty easy you inject the javascript hook which communicates to the attacker's browser with the exploitation framework uh, it's called beef it's a really cool framework you guys should play with it a little bit it's uh you can also use xss hunter of course but some Companies don't allow third-party hosted POC providers, so you should always host your XSS Hunter locally. Um, you just inject that JavaScript hook, you wait for the application user to view that vulnerable page, and then that hook is going to call upon your Beef console, and you can control the user's browser that way, and you can do stuff like grab stored uh, passwords, uh, grab cookies, and all that cool stuff. Um, of course beef is going to be a lot less applicable in real life because beef is going to need to make an egress connection which means it's going to need to make a connection from inside your attacker's network to your network that needs to go through a lot of fireworks firewalls possibly fireworks cutting uh, it needs to go to a lot of firewalls and those are going to possibly block that egress traffic um, so it has a lot of caveats there you can also just use something like XSS Hunter to try and grab the cookies, but you will have to fight some defense mechanisms as well, possibly. Um, the file upload, we already talked about that. Name of the file might be vulnerable, so use your cross-site scripting attack factors as names of the files as well. For the filter bypassing, we have that whole separate chapter in our course, so I will see you guys there. And for gray box testing, again, it's very similar to black box testing, where the tester has partial knowledge of the application but not fully he's not going to be able to view all of the source code he's just going to be able to view like the javascript or something like that and the tester can then better craft the payload in that case because he can look at where he syncs his values and then he can he can you know adapt to that specific location for example, if he inserts into an attribute with a single quote and he was using a double quote and a less than sign to test for, uh, sorry, I mean a greater than sign, of course. If he was using this to test for cross-site scripting, but he notices that he is inserting into a single quote, he might switch over to that or even a back tick. There are several possibilities there. 
Um, the tester can then better craft his payload and it will be better for everybody. The JavaScript source file is available. If it's fully white box testing, if the tester has access to all of the source code, he needs to analyze all of the locations where there are stored values being reflected into the JavaScript or HTML context. Um, you need to use your front-end application and enter your input with special or invalid characters like the less than sign, like the single quote, like the double quote, the greater than sign. We talked about these in the reflected cross-subscription section uh, and you're going to need to analyze your application response to identify the presence of those input validation controls. Um, if for example you input your greater than sign and you get an error that means that you're not allowed to input that, that you need to, for example, you need to encode it with the ampersand LT point comma sign, or maybe you need to do the percent, I think it's 3E or 3C, but I'm not sure. So there's many different ways to encode this, which again is going to be in a separate section. And then you're going to need to access the backend systems and check if that input is stored and how it is stored. So if we are able to store some input, we need to know how it is stored and also how it is reflected into the source code again. Is it in the JavaScript? Is it in the HTML? Where is it reflected? How is it reflected specifically? Those are all going to matter in our search for JavaScript. And that's why it's so important that you know JavaScript properly. As for tools, we have a lot of the same ones. We have PHP Character Encoder, a really useful tool. Hack Factor Verter, also a really useful tool. XSS Assistant Grease Monkey Script, which allows easier users to easily test any web application for cross-site scripting flaws. I am not convinced, but some people swear by it, so I would thought I would recommend it. You guys can look into it and draw your own conclusions. Then you also have Beef, which is the browser exploitation framework. Uh, really useful in certain scenarios and others not so much. Um, it's going to be mostly used to demonstrate the real life impact of your attack. Then of course we also have the Burr proxy and the OASP OASP Z proxy. So we have some ZAP there. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you use. Both are going to be equally good. Uh, it's just a matter of finding your groove and finding the correct tool that fits you. As for the references, again, we used the cross-site scripting sheet sheet from OWASP, really good resource. There's also a burp sheet sheet, which I will link in the extra resources file below this documentation. You can also look at the web security testing guide, which was a reference for this document. Um, you can look at some of the papers that were included as well. Those are some really interesting reads. Thank you very much for watching Amazing Hacker and I will see you in the next chapter. See you soon.